While most of America in the late 1970s was mired in recession, one paradise was booming. But Miami, Florida's relentless march of progress came at a heavy price. Griselda Blanco would admit to running a massive narcotics ring, conspiring to import and distribute literally tons of cocaine into the United States. She's accused of ordering dozens of murders. I was surprised that it was a woman, hard to fathom. We were all surprised that a female godmother was responsible for this much violence, could be this evil. Brazil de Blanco fled her war-torn homeland in 1974. While she started at the bottom of the drug trade, she would become one of the leading distributors of cocaine for the infamous Medellin cartel. Medellin is a beautiful city now, and it is unfortunately thanks to drug money. Pablo Escobar and a few of the great Colombian kingpins had so much power that they had politicians and police and the federal police on his payroll. They think they're invincible. Pablo Escobar, wasn't for Griselda Blanco, there would be no Pablo Escobar. Period, bar none. One of the reasons that I so like Griselda Blanco de Trujillo is she shows you where women's rights are. You think there isn't a woman who can compete in the tough and rough world of drug dealing? Go and look at Griselda and she'll straighten you out very quickly on that. She broke the glass ceiling in terms of female drug traffickers. She was somewhat of a visionary. She knew that the market for cocaine hydrochloride was starting to expand in the United States. She saw an opportunity, and she took advantage of that. At the height of Griselda's reign in Miami, cocaine use was rampant. It's estimated that thousands of illegal Colombians were living and working within the billion-dollar drug industry there. You're talking about a time where it's wide open and you got every Tom, Dick, and Harry trying to establish a name for themselves, you know? Our goal is to break the power of the mob in America and nothing short of it. We mean to end their profits, imprison their members, and cripple their organizations. Ronald Reagan actually declared war on drugs in South Florida. Sent a special task force down, flooded this area with federal agents who said, This is like throwing a dart at a board. This is the easiest thing we've ever seen to make arrests. Come on, they're all over here. South Florida cannot be a haven for criminals, for sophisticated and organized drug traffickers. Hey, it's the largest effort the federal government ever made in modern times to have to intervene in that a region, a city, an area, a county was uh, out of control. There were so many ways that the system was being bought and manipulated that if the federal government had not come in as the cavalry, it wasn't going to get cleaned up. In many ways, Griselda Blanco built this town. In the late 70s, dealers like her put their cocaine profits into banks. The banks, in turn, loaned that money to businesses, home buyers, and developers. There are thousands of properties worth more than a billion dollars that have been bought with illicit money in South Florida. There are many stories of cash green money being brought to homeowners and agents in suitcases and paper bags. Condominiums shot up like weeds, and just overnight, it just changed the landscape of the city. After over 10 years of intense investigation, Miami and Metro Police say they have enough evidence to pin the 1982 murders of three Day County people on this woman, 51-year-old Grisela Blanco. If she was not one of the most prolific traffickers in the Miami area. She clearly was one of the more violent.
Prosecutors had her former henchmen lined up and ready to testify against her. We transported her from federal custody to state custody in 1994. 1994 to 1998 was spent basically deposing all of the witnesses that would be testifying against her, which turned out to be an extremely lengthy process. Over those four years, the government's case collapsed in scandal. There was a problem with Jorge Ayala, who was our star witness against her, her number one hitman, who uh, became romantically involved with one of the secretaries at the state attorney's office. It was all over the Miami Herald. Uh, the state attorney's office was embarrassed. They had to fire several people. Rivi basically did a great job at botching the whole case by having phone sex with the secretaries. Eventually, the decision was made by the prosecution that the key witnesses had been compromised to the point of it affecting his credibility on the stand. Deals were made, and she ended up pleading guilty and essentially received a 10-year sentence. So people say this was planned, that this was Rivy's way of redeeming himself for initially snitching Griselda out, you know? It was like this grand scheme. As far as to be honest with you, I'll never know, you know? It did work out to Ms. Blanco's benefit in the end. They have her under the Super Kingpin Act. They can put her away for life in prison, a pine box sentence. It's the equivalent of being in a pine box. You're never going to get out, and she gets 10 years. And that's just uh, almost beyond, that's almost unfathomable to me. In June of 2004, Griselda Blanco was released and immediately deported as well. We all believed at the time that she had made so many enemies in her professional life that as soon as she reached the tarmac uh, on the airport in Colombia, that her lifespan was almost nil. Turns out we were all wrong. The last we see of her in 2007 at Bogota at the airport, and that's all we know. The whole saga is so uh, rife with uh, what, what seems like fiction uh, that uh, if you were to tell me that uh, she was alive and uh, serving as an abbess in a, in a monastery in Colombia, it would seem entirely appropriate. It's a frustration to this day that she's not in prison, that she's not on death row, because that's where she should be. It's a tremendous disappointment. However, having said that, um, I still believe that things go full circle. And one day, um, she'll answer to all this.